My plan for today, I realize last time was not the most fun you've ever had. It wasn't the most fun I've ever had either, just to be totally clear. Like, I'd get bored too. But I'm going to preface this class this way. Today, we're going to talk a lot about Jarvis. We kind of need to. We spent weeks on the book. I feel like we at least owe Jarvis a class. And also, you know, you got four sources in your paper. She's one of the sources. We really need to make sure we have a good handle on her. What I want to do with that, we're going to put a lot of stuff, like a lot of her ideas up on the board. We're going to use that to actually start, hopefully, performing a little bit of synthesis, okay? Actually thinking about how we're going to if not start building the paper outright, start building like the skeleton of the paper, okay? Provided we get through all of that in a reasonable fashion, uh, in, in terms of time, I'll try to get you guys out a little early today. <clears throat> That's my hope. That's like my olive branch. All right, to begin with, and this will, and this will probably start kind of slowly. That's how things like this go. If you cast your mind back to the sort of primordial classes we had at the start of this unit, I have a similar, I, I don't even really want to call it a chart, but whatever this is with Oliver, right? And we had like reasons to pay student athletes, reasons, reasons to not, yeah. I want to try to fill in this side um, with some of Jarvis's bigger ideas, her arguments, okay? And it may seem like she has a lot because her paper is longer than anything you guys are used to in terms of this stuff, right? She doesn't. I'm telling you, she doesn't. She has one really big idea, which we've already kind of covered last time, and she's got a couple smaller ones in the section you read. So all that out of the way. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, what about that? Can we can we talk about that for a second? Like comparing it to Slaughterhouse? Whatever. No, no, no. Just stay in Jarvis for, for just this little bit, if you could. Um, she just makes it seem like it's not as, I guess, scary or... No, it's for damn sure scary. Like, like, uh... Like her terminology for it. I was going to ask, does anybody... She, she puts it a certain way. She it, says clean, straightforward, refreshingly, um, unambiguous. Yes, that's a good quotation, but the, she, she has a snappy, like, phrase she keeps using. Uh, no, that's just a crazy word. She had, like, she puts it in quotation marks herself. Good war, bad war, right? Like, that, that's the idea. And everything you guys are, like, it's within that larger idea. That's the point I'm making, okay? Huge chunk of her thesis. Uh, however many pages you had to read, I think it was, like, 10 or 12 or something. Honestly... Probably damn near half of that is her breaking down, going through different ways she wants to think about good war, bad war, right? But that's the big idea. <clears throat> and just so we can sort of put a cap on that for now, what does that even mean, good war, bad war? She's, she's talking about it in relation to Vonnegut. But she's saying Bonnie is trying to do something. Show that it wasn't just a good war, they had its good and its bad side. She, she keeps, uh, she, at different points, she talks about it being gray, not black and white. Uh, you know, again, the book came out in 1969. A lot of people were pretty fed up with Vietnam, the idea of it, it's a bad war because it is ambiguous, because it's not clear cut, all that stuff. And her point is, Vonnegut kind of looks around, it's the world he's in when he's writing this book, and he goes, this doesn't feel super different from World War II, actually, guys. I, I think we should revisit that, like, and tries to, to take our sort of common conception of World War II and, and move it at least more toward somewhere in the middle, right? Yeah. Good. All right. Now, well, there's two directions we can head in. I'll say it like this. There are smaller arguments within Jarvis, okay, that fall under this umbrella. And if you happen to light upon one, uh, I'm just gonna put it under this because some of those are actually really worth discussion, okay? But 
I'm also going to ask if you can think of any other arguments, because she does make a couple other ones. Uh, I'd, I'd like to get that stuff up on the board. So I'm just curious. Anything else that struck you? If you want to revisit your notes, that's a joke for me. You guys don't take notes. You really should. Um, anything at all from Jarvis? The, the Slaughterhouse Five section you were meant to read. I should just say that um, he utilized the uh, Moorland Bay for fragment blends of Vietnam by like the seedier like elements of the Good War. Like, yeah. He highlights like elements of Vietnam and he kind of compares and contrasts them against like World War II. Yeah. Similar in a lot of ways. Is that, and you may not know this, is that there's a little bit of a section where she's. She's drawing all these like direct parallels between Vietnam and World War II in the book. Like at one point she talks about Curtis LeMay. Do you guys remember this section? He's the guy who, who in real life famously said, bomb them back into the Stone Age, when he said that about Vietnam. He also, according to her, wanted to use nukes in Vietnam, which uh, would have been some shit. Um, huh? Maybe, I mean, I. Well, I, well, I mean, we're saying this in 2022, I mean, but even at the time, that was kind of a fringe opinion that we ought to do that. But he was a real guy, and she says there's a dude in the book, a uh, speaker at the Lions Club, who's clearly meant to basically be like a fictionalized Curtis LeMay, right? And she's saying like moments like this are, are trying to directly for the reader connect Vietnam to World War II in terms of like ideas, people, basically, I, I think the upshot of that, she, she talks about it again, sort of under this umbrella, but I also think it's mostly just these wars aren't so different, you know, you have the same kinds of ideas and approaches, so that the characters uh, represented in both, right? But yeah, I would put that I would put that under here for sure. That's one of the moments I was thinking about. Okay. Anything else strike you guys? That's a really good I'm gonna write both of these. So And like one of the quotes that she used uh, in regards to John Wayne. Sands of Iwo Jima. Yeah, yeah, that. And she said hard boiled, bloody guys, heroism. Yeah. Well, let's let's finish that real quick, because that's a it's a really small moment, but to me it's one of my favorite moments in the paper. What's the deal with Sands of Iwo Jima? It's not just that it was popular and it's exactly the kind of movie Mary's talking about, right? What happens with that movie? She gives you like a little story about that movie. I'm gonna be honest with you. If you missed this, you were not reading very carefully. The part where she uh, mentions young men wearing wet skins. Her dad went to see it, and when he came out, you you can finish. Sorry, what what happened? Um, there were marine recruiters. What were they doing? Um, setting up booths in the lobby of the theater. And young men were signing up enthusiastically. Yeah. Right. I can't do two things at once. Sorry. What's the deal with that? Why is that uh, noteworthy? Oh, they for sure did. I mean, I the first time I read that, I was like, how is that legal? Um, but if I were to say, this is exactly what Mary's worried about, like in real life, what, what, what do I mean by that? What, what's going on here? Why are these guys signing up? Well, you go really hard at the paint, but, but yeah, I mean, essentially they saw a movie, they saw a movie and they were like, that looks cool. And then they come outside and the dude's like, do you want to do that for real? He's like, that's your fucking ass I do. <laughs> right. And again, we have not, I have not at least been to war, so I cannot speak 100% certainly, but I'm pretty sure it's not like the movies. I'm like fairly confident, you know. And so these guys, 18, 19, like your age, go to see a movie. That'd be like you coming out of Endgame. You're like, hey man, do you want to be an Avenger? And you're like, fuck yeah, I do. But it's not like that. It's not like that even a little bit. Like they mentioned that they would like 
no doubt they would go to the Korean War. Yeah, they were going to the Korean War at that point. Yeah. And it's like, as if it's some big thing to do that everybody looks forward to in a way. Yeah, well, and again, if that's all you know is the movies, I could easily see where you would be like, that looks really badass. I would like to do that very much, please. And you're going to pay me and like feed me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go and get your ass shot off. Anyway. Anything else you guys have? Those are two really good moments. There's more, but any, anything else? I, can, I have little hints I'll give you guys, but I'm curious just anything at all. Let's see. She talked about the Englishman at one point. Do you guys remember any of that? She has like a whole paragraph or two. Yeah. She does, and that. There's some good stuff there. We can skip to that if you like for a moment. Um, some of that, quite honestly, there's really good stuff in that section, to be totally fair to her. There's some really interesting stuff. Some of it, I feel like, is a little bit half baked, like kind of like. But you'll see that sometimes. And again, these are like 20, 30 page articles. It's almost like you have the room to just go, this is weird, huh? Like it, some of it feels like that. Um, but one thing in particular, she's talking about bodies and she talks about the trains, but she does it in a different way a little bit from how we talked about it. I'm sort of hoping that rings bells. If not, I, I can finish the thought. But does anybody remember when she's talking about the, the trains? Yeah, again, we looked at that section, right? That is a super interesting section. Uh, does anybody remember her kind of her point with why Vonnie might be doing that? Because we actually arrived at a different argument. Something about, I mean, to, to help you guys a little bit, uh, the train we're talking about gets compared to an organism. Really, to be more specific, gets compared to like a person, you know, in with food and whatever, out came shit and piss and language, that whole bit. Um, her point basically is all through the book, you get stuff like this where people are dehumanized, right? And she says, and I don't think she's wrong, but she says, um, this is what war does, according to Vonnegut. Like this is sort of how war has to operate. It makes you like a train, it makes you like a machine. Uh, and we see that throughout the book, right? To go ahead and move to the other side real quick, and we'll do this more later. I've said a few times, we, we talked about the trains in a related but a slightly different way. Does anybody remember how we talked about the trains? I think... And my memory is terrible. I feel like Holt might have said that they're on tracks. Yeah, I feel like that would be yeah. trying to get the same like Good. Is that what you're into? I was gonna say like, you're trying to get the same like what's the same thing about being about trains in Tennessee, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We took way too fucking long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but again, that's that's different from this, at least on the surface, right? And what's interesting to me. is that both make all kinds of sense, right? In the context of this book, like I could easily see either one of those arguments for that train section. Um, so that's something that we, we might consider here in a couple minutes, right? But that's just a ready-made, like, we read that section and we, we said something else almost entirely. All right, anything else from Jarvis? There's a couple more things, but I'm just curious what else you guys might have been able to summon. Yeah, Robert, Billy's son. What about him? Um, um, he was very, it was very well kept compared to Billy. He was kind of like the polar opposite of Billy. In order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a Green Beret, which is pretty impressive, right? And also, like, they also kind of mentioned the fact that he was um, a lot like the other, like, how was this, the other people that were his age. They were all sons of veterans that's their yeah well the point she ends up making about Robert and it's kind of piggybacking on the last thing you said 
uh, she talks about their honeymoon, like their wedding night or whatever, and that one of the really icky parts where it talks about the green beret was now forming in a cavity inside of Valencia, like that, and you're like, you? Yeah, but she, it's while Valencia is saying uh, something about, you know, you know, do, do you know that I'm proud of you? Uh, tell me about the war, like all that stuff. Yeah, lots of yeah, yeah, that, that whole conversation they have. And the way Jarvis reads that is, this is literally kind of World War II, the narrative about it, because that's what, that's all Valencia has, right? And we talked about how she's super wrong about Billy in a lot of ways. Um, but the narrative she has about World War II, how that is directly sort of building Robert, right? And, and the ideas he's going to have when he's of age, he's going to sign up, he's going to be, you know, Green Beret, Vietnam, all that stuff. We probably, almost, hmm, I'll include it as part of the Vietnam discussion. But the, but the way Robert is formed, right, in that scene, the way she talks about it. Good? There's also a part where she mentions um, the Green Red Line. Okay. And she says that that mainly talks about, like, rotting Japanese corpses and, like, an American body. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when it comes to, like, hundreds of corpse, corpse mines and... Um, where the destruction of Dresden is. Yeah, it's only, and it's only like the last, you know, couple pages of the book. Yeah. Yeah. It primarily is on other techniques to dramatize the Lord's terrible effects on bodies. Like they compare the, the effects of one to the other, but it's not the same comparison. Yeah. Well, and it, she kind of spins off a little bit. That's the section where we were kind of talking about earlier. Uh, all this bodies business. She finds a really long-winded way to say... Uh, that Vonnegut fragments bodies in like a narrative way rather than a literal way, which is what most other books will do, you know, uh, to translate that, like people get exploded and like, you know, in a horror film kind of way. But Vonnegut doesn't do that. Other than the fragmented bodies business, which I think she's way too proud of herself for, it's actually not, it's mostly just an observation. She does make an argument about it at a certain point. She, she tells us why Vonnegut fragments uh, the narrative rather than bodies, why he doesn't give us all the gore uh, that we would probably assume at some point. This is a war novel, right? Like, it's kind of part of it. Does anybody remember why she argues Vonnegut doesn't give us that stuff? Or even if you didn't read, as some of you admitted to me before class, which is an interesting strategy. Um, you might you might be able to sort out like why wouldn't Vonnegut give us that stuff? There's a time they're arguing about like they don't have the characters in the book maybe. Does that make a difference? I don't know. You tell me. Well, he talks about his you know was it his wife who was perfectly nice standard issue brown hair and you know yeah that's when he goes on about like no one there's no characters it's just yeah you know, standard issue that's a standard issue why yeah so like I feel like if he um, brought more into it it would make us feel for the characters which I don't really want. Why? Yeah. Well, and, yeah, th that's part of it. But I'm saying it could do something else too. You were so close. What? Why else? We we, we did talk about this. I know we talked about a lot of things. Why else doesn't Vonnegut have characters? Why else does Vonnegut write a book that's like all over the place? It's not just straight through like you would be used to, right? Like. So it doesn't seem to be like Yeah. He's, he's, in some ways, I think, fighting against human nature. Like, even in the worst movies you've ever seen, surely you've seen a bad movie in your life, you can almost always find, like, a character that you pull for or, or whatever, you know? Um, but it's really hard in this book. It's hard to find anybody. It's hard to track anybody, right? To kind of build that momentum that we need. And she, she says that, it's kind of quick, and that's what I mean by like, that's a really good point. I don't know why she's so busy with the, ooh, he's fragmenting bodies. Um, but the point here is, and we didn't talk about this a little bit, um,
the way the fragmented narrative, the structure of the book, along with like absence of characters, largely absent of drama, all these things keeps you from being entertained, right? Why is he doing that? I know you know this. Why doesn't he want us to be entertained? That, keep it his promise. Yeah. It, and it's a weird thing to think about, but if at any point for the narrator, if you're in the book and you're like, yeah, he feels like he's failed. Because his experience of war, what he's trying to get across to you is, there should be no moments like that. At no point should you see people fighting if you're the narrator and think, fuck yeah. Like that, that's the opposite of what he's after. Cool. Those are pretty good. I, I wonder if we missed anything. We put down the Englishman, that's okay. They're really just another part of this business. Uh, she says at one point, we're not so different from the Nazis, which is a, is a hell of a thing to say, uh, given, I would imagine, how we conceptualize Nazis, right? Um, I don't think I've pointed this out to you guys. You, know, you may or may not have noticed. He almost never uses that word in the book. He always calls them German soldiers or Germans or people. The only time he talks about Nazis is when he's talking about Campbell, uh, who's an American who for sure chose, like signed up, right, to be a Nazi. If you consider, you know, and there were for sure a lot of enthusiastic Germans in the 30s. Like, I'm not, don't, don't misunderstand me. There are a lot of people doing that whole fucking thing that are like really into it. There was also millions of people who woke up one day and they're like, hey, we're Nazi now. And they're like, shit, I got some Nazi too. <laughs> what else could you do? <clears throat> Plenty of people said no. I'm gonna let you, it didn't go well for them. It doesn't go well. And so it's, so a lot of, again, the same thing he tries to have you, he tries to have you appreciate all the German soldiers, all the German people that you come across in the book as people rather than Nazis. Right, because because once you do that, I mean, I, I speaking for myself here, they're they're a caricature in my head, right? Like they got the mustache, or they like, you know, they're doing fucked up stuff. But no, he's like, no, these are just people that happen to live in Germany during the 30s and 40s, right? So they're not that different from us. Is one of the points that she makes in Vonnegut, which I think is important. Um, anything else? Oh, oh! she does talk about the machine people, but this is a, an offshoot of the dehumanization business. She says the narrator rejects this, which I think is interesting because that would tie into that, I think. I'm hoping that makes any sense. I may just be talking to myself right now, but. Well, we'll see if we can figure that out in a minute. All right. At this point, we could add a couple things to this list, but this is pretty good. This is a pretty good start, okay? <clears throat> what I want to do now is attempt to add some things to this side. Now, understand one thing. To do this in the way that we did it uh, at the start of the unit, we would just add arguments and ideas significant sections in our opinion <clears throat> to this side not really have anything to do with this right the point i'm making to you is because the book is a book there's a lot in it once you take an article or two or three because that's what you're supposed to have by the end of this process right and you got it kind of broken down like this with like big ideas you can then go to that longer text and say all right what might tie into any of this, right? What might have anything to do with this? I can get it up here and I can <clears throat> start building, you know, paragraphs potentially. So, you guys tell me. Anything at all. And we, uh, we already kind of started one. We'll come to that in a minute. But, but I'd like to get some more ideas on this side. Anything you feel like would speak to for Vonnegut? What do you think? Good war, bad war, we keep it like gray area. But that was his whole point. 
Well, this is a good start. So we need to have something at least a little bit specific. I feel you on that. I, oh, I agree. Is there anything we can point to in the book? Um, it doesn't have to be a quotation. It could be paraphrased, but like something a little more specific than saying like, well, that's the whole book, right? We want to... Can you... Go ahead. About Mary, about the promise of suffering. What about it? Throughout the book, talk about us not glorifying the Lord, so talk about good Lord, bad Lord. You did several things very quickly. Um, let's, uh, okay. So if I understand you correctly, you want to start here with Mary? Can we think of a way or a moment that he avoids the glamorization of war? I can think of a bunch, but like this is my job, so. Just one, one way that he keeps us, you can almost argue, from like being entertained or enthusiastic. What about just tells us like every time we wish he was there? Good. For sure. Uh, he he spoils the climax, right? With Derby. It's like you want to root for Derby so bad, but it makes it so hard. He's like the one guy that you want to like at the same time. Yeah. He builds him up and he immediately carries the Derby down. Like, yeah, he doesn't let you like yeah, yeah. And again, like if you think if you think for a minute how Derby would probably be portrayed, like in a movie, a more classic kind of story, the reasons he gives for coming, and he had to like trick his way into it because he, he he he's feeling virtuous about it, basically, right? Like just talking about it now, I I, I kind of feel what you're saying, right? Like, like, move on, I'm up the way, like, a little bit, yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah. He's so honorable, he's so driven by honor. No, for sure. Uh, but yeah, yeah, at every turn, uh, first of all, he tells you he's going to die immediately, right, every time he comes up. But then also at various points, he kind of cuts the knees out from under him and kind of makes it seem like Derby, while having good motivations, another way to think of it is like he's a little bit full of shit, right? A little flaming ego, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't diminish his motivations at all, like, but, but, yeah. it for sure makes it hard to root for the guy, it makes it hard to, like, feel invested um, good so potentially we've started a body paragraph we're talking about uh, how Jarvis talks about Mary and uh, the promise that the narrator has to make glamorization of war that that business uh, and how one of the ways and there's a bunch one of the specific ways he does that the narrator is by spoiling the climax for Derby making it next to impossible to root for that character. You can find a quotation for that if you want. I don't think it'd be terribly difficult. Good. Now, in your papers, you will have two more texts, right? Listed right here. We don't have that today, but just know that that would be an option. You could potentially go from here to, oh, and this guy says whatever, right? Like you could, you could do that. For our purposes today, all we're gonna be able to do is try to now go from here either to something else from Jarvis or something else from Vanya. So I'm just curious if you guys, the way we're talking about uh, Mary keeping that promise, not wanting to glamorize war, we've moved to Derby and how we spoil the climax, how we uh, make it impossible to root for that character. Can we go anywhere over here or can we think of something else from Vani, we might also. I see a really good one in Jarvis, personally, but again. Yeah, is there anything, is there anything toward the bottom of the list on the Jarvis side? It might go really well with uh, not wanting to glamorize war, make it hard for you to root for people, you know. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Also, I don't want anybody watching to miss the show. So. Why do you say that? Obviously, they're going to be having human eyes. Like, they're going to 
insane. Would they? I understand why you're saying that, but hang on for just a minute. Even in that term, right, war hero. Mm -hmm. No, but to Valencia he is. And we've said, that's a great example, I wasn't going to go there, that's stupendous. Does she really know Billy? No, she does not. She assumes things about him, given what little she knows. She makes him into a war hero. But if we're, if we're, <clears throat> if we're saying her making him into, viewing him as a war hero, tells us immediately that she knows jack shit about this guy. She doesn't know him as a person. Well, she knows him as a war hero. That would suggest, I think pretty strongly, that the second you make someone into a hero, war or otherwise, you're no longer viewing them as a person, right? You're like bringing this whole narrative to bear and sort of applying it to that person. This is why, by the way, and you didn't ask for any of this, and I do apologize, but this is why, by the way, when like a celebrity likes a racist tweet or like, you know what I'm saying, like does anything that even a little bit like maybe kind of fucked up, millions of people are like burning cars in the street and fucking like distraught because they're not, they, they've made them into heroes. They made them into like almost myth when that's not true. Like no one can be that. You see what I'm saying? And if we make a person into a thing no one can be, well then we're fundamentally saying we're dehumanizing them. Does that make sense? The hang up would be, and I fully get it, dehumanizing is bad. Making somebody into a hero sounds great. So like they can't be, but I think it's, I think it's just you're going so far in both directions you kind of come around and close the circle. But a fair shot, for sure. Kind of dive into why they say never meet your heroes. Yeah. Like, well, because you'll understand them as a person. Yeah. It's just never meet who Billy really is. Wouldn't you just be disappointed? Great example. I met a poet one time who I was really into, and he, this is years and years and years ago, and I was trash. And he read my stuff and he told me it was trash. Yeah. And I was like, you're a dick. Bro, he was. He was a dick about it, actually. Do you really want to write like? Do you really want to write this? Is this what you want to do? And I was like, No. I would love to be better. You fucking asshole. Um, I'm not bitter about it. <laughs> but yeah, kind of found out that day. Not who I thought. Poems are great, dude. Maybe not. Yeah. Anyway. I'm way better now, for whatever that's worth. Um, let's try something else. Not wanting to glamorize war, spoils the climax, makes it impossible to root for Derby. We got a smallish menu over here. How does he avoid, try to avoid, glamorizing war? There's one other thing on Jarvis. Well, he avoids details. He always goes into the so it goes thing. He does, and we actually did. I don't know if that's in Jarvis. That could be so that could be on Vonnegut's side. No, but no, but that's okay. Um, so it goes, and I, uh, it was you or is Laney or is both was asking about and so on the other day. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, but this business of glossing over what would perhaps normally be kind of diving into a person, their inner workings, right? Um, he kind of purposefully, you could argue, sums them up, you know, makes them into less of a person. Uh, now we're getting into your dehumanization business, so maybe that'd be an interesting angle for you. Um, oh. I'm trying to think of the least insane way to do this. I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to. And so on. In everything you just said, and that, could get us to dehumanization, right? And to bear in mind, Jarvis is talking about it like the narrator dehumanizes people to illustrate for us what war does to people. That's her thing. Our way into it is Mary doesn't want the narrator to glamorize war, so the narrator doesn't. He works against it, right, with this. He does it in other ways right, that are, I don't know, pretty different, I think, 
that dehumanizes people, which makes it hard to root for them, hard to pull for them as, as people, as characters, just like war does. That's a paragraph. That's going to be a longish paragraph, to be honest with you. Let's do another one. We've talked about this. Let's do this one, since we already started it. To remind you. And interestingly enough, actually, this paragraph ends with this idea from Jarvis, so that would make a great transition to like a second body paragraph. Jarvis points out, the narrator is constantly dehumanizing characters in the book because that's how war works. People aren't people, especially in world wars, right? They're just parts to get replaced or destroyed or whatever. The way we read that scene, and I think both are completely applicable, is this it? It's, it's dehumanization, but instead of war, it's what destiny or fate does to people, right? If you firmly, truly believe in destiny, fate, then people aren't really people, according to that scene, right? They're just, it's the Trophy Midorian mindset, right? We're all doing exactly what we're supposed to do, no choice involved. Um, and then one day you die. That's, that's kind of it. This will be trickier, so I think we could probably do it. Can you think of any connections we might make from this destiny, fate, the dehumanizing quality of it? Can, can we go anywhere else from there? In Jarvis or the book? I think the book will be easier, to be honest with you. Put it to you this way. Oh, go ahead. You don't have to have a fully formed idea right now, right? I'm trying to the best of my ability, I understand it's difficult, uh, give you a little bit of a view into how this might work for you in your dorm room or whatever, right? You're just sitting there, you got notes about Jarvis, and if you don't, I'm gonna say it again, you should take, you should take some fucking notes. But you have, you have notes about Jarvis, hopefully you have some notes about the book, and you're trying to, how am I gonna, you know? Okay. She talks about dehumanization and Vonnegut. Cool, cool. Uh, this scene, we read that scene. That we did, we did a thing with fate and the tracks, and like that makes total sense. Where the fuck am I gonna go from there? If you're talking about fate in Slaughterhouse Five, you almost have to talk about what? Yeah, you almost have to. That's their whole deal. The only reason they're in the book, they won't shut up about it, right? So let's think about that for a minute. I say there's only a couple scenes. There's only a couple big scenes. They are throughout the book. They come up a lot. But can you guys remember any like specific moments? There's a couple that are a little longer. So by that token, maybe a little more significant. But like longer moments with the Trophy Midorians. Can you guys think of any? Huh? Whenever he's in the zoo, that's pretty weird. Can you remember anything uh, specifically from that? that like, he, I feel like he was like, did he tell them what the war was going on? And they, they were just like, okay, we'll do us. That's how it's supposed to be. I think the moment you're talking about, he's talking to him, and then he's, and then he tries to be really high minded. He says something like, you know, and on my planet we have terrible wars, and you guys don't. Please. He uses language like, please share your wisdom with me so I can take it back to my people. Like, he sounds ridiculous. Like, he sounds like a character, you know, a little bit. And uh, the Tropomidorians all uh, close their eyes, which which he has learned at that point, the narrator tells us, means they're embarrassed for him. They're like, oh, God, fucking idiot, right? Like, and he's like, what did I do wrong? And that's when... Uh, I guess, I think it's the guide, but I mean, like, the zookeeper, basically, tells him, yeah, man, we have war. What else did he tell him? He says, we do have war. We just do this thing instead. This is important. They ignore it. It's ugly. We don't look at that. Ew. He says, we look at days like this. Isn't this a nice day? And Mark Billy's like, yeah, it is a nice day. You're right. 
That's an interesting idea. So from this destiny, fate, dehumanizing people, we have an offshoot on Earth, at least that for a second, of like, <sighs> intentional ignorance. Does that make sense? Because you can be, everybody's ignorant of things, like, but to intentionally be so, to, to purposefully go, nah. And how that's weirdly connected in the book to this idea of how fate works. I mean, let's, let's tease that out for a second. Basically, he's saying, if you believe in fate and you believe there's nothing you can do about anything, right? Well, some good things are going to happen to you and some fucking terrible things are going to happen to you. And if that's true and there's nothing you can do about any of that, I guess it would make sense to ignore the bad stuff. And just go... Nom, 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 nom. Right? Like, only think about the good stuff because you can't change it anyway. We have not talked about this in this class, but I'm going to tell you right now we are on the precipice of what I would argue is a thesis of the book. Okay? So, get excited. This is outside of Jarvis for a second, but it may help you when it comes to other articles. Why the fuck, and I say it that way on purpose, why the fuck is Vonnegut talking about fate in this book? Intentional ignorance. Who the fuck, why do we have aliens? The book is weird enough. If we're trying to like not have you care about characters and be entertained, it nails that. I would argue that the aliens run the risk of giving you something to go, ooh, aliens, right? Like it's fucking weird. <clears throat> Why do we keep talking about fate? Why is Billy, I mean, Billy kind of like falls into this, right? He kind of illustrates what a person living this way would, would be like, right? The main character. So why do you think in this book are we doing that? Well, weirdly, the term dehumanization, because we are so um, anthropocentric, which is to say we consider everything according to the human being-ness, uh, we would want to appreciate the personhood of these fictional aliens. So, so the fact that they are aliens would not disqualify them from humanity. Does that make sense? All that was very stupid. But that... that the way when we talk about being a human being, we would full on apply that to like, if we found people on Mars tomorrow, tomorrow we'd be like, we need to appreciate their humanity. But they're not people, like, you get it, you know what I'm saying. Because we, really the truth is, we have no language to talk about personhood outside of being a person because we've never met anyone else, right? Anyway. What's the deal? with making Billy. Like we understand on some level the Trout Midorians being this way, they're aliens. Apparently they can see time. They're super different from us, okay? Billy is not. What's the deal with making Billy intentionally ignorant? Has for sure seen some shit. We, we find out about it, right? And is for sure tormented by it. We see that occasionally. But does his best to not even admit it to himself. You know, kind of put the blinders on. Why are we doing that? For 200 something pages. What's Billy's deal when it comes to what he thinks about life? Let's just talk this out for a second. What does Billy think about life? How it works? What it's for? He doesn't know a lot about it, really. No? No? He's very content with whatever he's cross yeah content's a pretty good word I mean that's part of it too right you don't get too up you don't get too down um, and that that kind of harkens back to well if there's nothing you can do about it he's satisfied so one of those well and again I, I think happy is too strong do you know what I mean I, guess content. I think content's much better he's just he's all right you know 
one day I'll get assassinated, oh well, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, he treats, yeah, like, just for himself and everybody around him. Everybody. Just, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's just another part of life. Like, everybody's going to die. And again, this is one of those things we know, to be fair to Billy. Like, yeah, that's, that is how it works. But I would think most of us would would sort of strongly disagree with how Billy conceives of that, right? Uh, and I, I think the example we use in class is if, uh, and I'll get emails like this occasionally, oh, my dog died, I can't come in this week, and if I was, if I said, so it goes. Get to class, bitch. What, uh, I don't know why I said that, but, uh, <laughs> What would you? What would be your response if you told me like my dog died? I, I can't do it, you know. And if I was like, nah, dogs die. It's my dog. Yeah, I'm, I'm not appreciating whatever you're going through I'm, uh, because I I'm diminishing the significance of it. I'm 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 kind of pissing on the relationship you had, right? Like, isn't that what it is when someone dies and you like you miss that person? You, you because you can no longer engage with them like you, you miss the person that's a valuable human beings would say that's a valuable thing did you hand up no. um and so we talked about how that's another way that billy is kind of dehumanized uh sort of adhering to this fate idea so strongly kind of makes him not a human being anymore sure still the question is why are we doing that in this book, we're real close. I promise we are. I promise we are. The narrator tells us, I'm going to help you guys out a little bit. This book is meant to do what? He says it a couple times. He also says there's no way it can do this, but like this is what the book is supposed to do. Sure. But in what way? Why does he write the book? You could argue he has two reasons, but why, why does he write the book? Well, he wants to, um, basically, like, this is not the good work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, guys, not what you think it is. Well, he, he says at one point to somebody uh, in the first chapter, he tells him the kind of novel it's going to be. What kind of novel is he writing? He tells the guy this. And the guy's like, you might as well write a book against glaciers. Uh, like stuff. Anti-war, yeah. And the guy makes the point, you're not gonna, you're not gonna stop war with a book, dude. Come on. She's distracting the shit out of me. It's not her fault. I'm trying real hard not to hear anything. She's talking about hospitals. I don't know. I was because I've lost my train of thought. It's what's bumming me out right now. Um, anyway, why are we talking about uh, anti-war? Oh, that's so that's what the book is supposed to do. It's supposed to like somehow try to stop war, convince you that they're not good. Okay. So that's our context, and we have Billy, who. Um, is dehumanized, right? Who who adheres to fate. You know, you, you have no choice in anything. We also mentioned that Billy sucks a couple times, right? Why are we doing that? Why does Billy suck? I don't mean, I know why he sucks, but like why does Vanya give us a main character who sucks? Because it wants to write to her That's one, and for sure, that's on the table. That'd be in a body paragraph. I think there's another reason, too. He's famously classified as an anti-hero. I'll give you that too. Yeah. Do I know? So you're feeling like he's petty and he's going through war, so it's already uh, not glamorizing the war, the idea of war that you have. Yeah. Like, like this, this guy's life just sucks. I think that could be part of it. We weirdly try to humanize a character who's not superhuman, right? Um, I could give you that, yeah. That's not what I'm driving at, but but for sure, that's for sure on the table as well. Um, 
How is this an anti-war book? Don't tell me it makes war look not glamorous. We've been there. We covered that. We're good on that. How is this an anti-war book? What does any of that got to do with fate? That's weird. Right? What does war have to do with fate? Are you talking about when the Nazis talking to him, maybe? Yeah, yeah. When, um, yeah, but I mean, as a reader, I mean, I, I would, anything that comes out of a Nazi's mouth, I think we're inclined to go. Um, but it kind of gives them like a, he tries to encourage them. Yeah, but yeah, I don't, I wouldn't say that that's fate, right? That's, that's uh, propaganda, that's what the Nazis are known for. It's, that's, it's a lie that like we can see. Um, I appreciate the shot, I do. Think about this for a second. We're very close. What has war got to do with fate? Is war unavoidable? Is it? Uh, probably. We got to go to the book for this. Did we get that idea in the book anywhere? Yes. Yes. Did I maybe just say it? Yeah, the trap for the lips and the potential aliens. I wouldn't even think about that. But yeah, that's great. I was talking about the dude who said you might as well write a book against glaciers, but. No, that, you're, you're good too. Yeah, the Trophimadorians say we have war. We can't do anything about it. So we just don't look at it. What do you have to lose? Good. So the point we're driving at here, and you gotta, you gotta go with me for a second. If you agree, and I think most people would be inclined to agree that there's no way we can stop war. Would it be a good thing to do that a lot of people would be down for? Yes. But when pressed, do you think we can actually stop it? And it's like, well, you're always going to have like a fucking Vladimir Putin or somebody like that. You know, like even me, you know, and actually I'm deeply cynical, so I'm not the best, but I would say probably not. It doesn't feel like there's anything we could do to stop it which is exactly what Vonnegut wants to do Vonnegut even says that he knows he can't stop it right we're talking about the absence of choice that sounds a lot like what like we're fated to always have war there's nothing we could do well, we sound like Billy don't we just a little bit just in this one regard we sound a lot like Billy shitty Sucky Billy. <laughs> Why do you think the book would do that to us? Have us try to see that. Given everything we've said about destiny and fate. Yeah. I'm just kind of confused about what you're asking. Like, are you saying? What does Vonnegut want us to do, according to his narrator? In regards to war, what does he want us to do? Make us be like, oh yeah, it's too far. He wants us to stop it. Yeah. He wants us to somehow, as a people, as a race, a human race, he wants us to stop it. And he says in the book, and we said, nah, that's probably not going to happen. We're going to shoot each other a whole bunch. That's kind of what we do. Um, so we're saying there's nothing we could do. So we're saying it's fate, or at least that operates like fate. Okay. We have no choice. We sound Trout from Midori. We sound like Billy. Why is he doing that? Why is he trying to have us sort of recognize that we're doing that? If we just spent a couple minutes talking about how Billy sucks and we don't agree with his name. <clears throat> Might be happier if we were more like Billy, maybe? <sighs> no. Well, I mean, in some regard, yeah, but I don't know how he's really doing. Look, if you want to write a book that's anti something you that you honestly feel like is something we can't ever stop, maybe all you can do is point that out to everybody that we all have that 
in some ways you could argue a logical idea like the, the the crux of it is this if we and i think many of us are believers in the idea of like free will you determine what you do you determine where you go generally speaking throughout your day throughout your life okay if we all feel that way and I want to think at least a lot of us are like, yeah, war would be a good thing to not have, you know, figure out other ways to do it. Um, then how, that's a weird discrepancy for all of us to just shrug at, ah, wars happen, right? Aren't we more than we would maybe admit otherwise, like Billy, in the fact that, I mean, shit, they're, they're killing each other in Ukraine right now, you know? don't care I don't give a fuck I just like like in my day after this uh, I'm gonna go home and do some stuff and then I'm gonna probably pick up my boys after school and they got shit tonight that I'm gonna do and like you know like I'm not I disregard it because I assume there's nothing I can do which is probably true in the grand scheme but again if we all make that assumption because we all do then nothing ever changes right it does just keep being a thing. I think the thesis of the book is, as a people, if we were to end war, the only way to do it would be to, to flip that switch and say there is something we could do. Even if it seems ineffectual, if it seems small, there is one thing we could all do and not just not assume that it's a given, not treat it like it's fate, right? And we still haven't done it. I haven't done it. I teach this book all the time. But, but that's the point. I didn't put that on the board, but that would be maybe the next thing we would talk about in our paragraph, right? I see all of you getting very antsy. What time is it? Huh? What did she say? 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock. Oh, shit. All right. Yeah, we're almost out of time. That took longer than I anticipated. I do appreciate you guys sticking it out. Before I let you go, thoughts, questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, pretty much what you're saying, the whole point of the book is to not treat war like it's worse than it happen. And even, it's, though, even though, like, it feels like we, if we try to do something, it's not really helping in the grand scheme of things, but even though it's not helping in the grand scheme, we should still try because it's not like to help and not cause war. I would argue that that's that's Vonnegut's idea. Yeah, is again because if, if you consider how just if we're just talking about war, I know we got all we all have other things going on, but if we're just talking about war, which is supposedly what the book is trying to do, how often do you really think about it in any given day? And especially, how often do you think about like <clears throat> whether or not there's anything you like if it ever comes up, right? At all, it's quick. And it's some version of, oh shit, or, mm -hmm. and you, you, you past it, right? We're really similar to Billy in that respect. That one respect, that's how he is in his whole life, right? And that's bananas. But like, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I said Ukraine, there's other wars going on that we don't even talk about in the news. I think it's Yemen, if I'm not mistaken, I can't even remember, uh, has been having a war for years now, like, fucking decade or something? Yemen, Yemen's um, suffering a really, really bad thing. Well, it's horrific. The whole area is fucking horrific, and we don't even, it's not even on the news. They don't even bother to report it. Because we wouldn't care. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, um, <clears throat> so I, I would argue that's, that's really the point. In showing us what it would look like if we did that all the time, which is Billy, but saying we do this more than we realize. We act like it's a given. We act like it's sort of destined to be that way. And we disregard it, which is exactly what you do if you adhere to fate. You know? Seems like everyone stopped hearing about Ukraine several months ago. Well, yeah, you got like a bumper sticker sticker yeah, kind of life cycle. But I think that's more to do with like our society than it is like. Yeah, they move on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah. The next current thing. The next hashtag. Yeah, that, that, that happens. And again, it's like, what can you do? Anyway. You can get mad about it and go on Twitter and run over tweets. Can't. How many do? 
Well, I see, but it, well, that's what Billy would say. You know what I mean? I'm saying Vonnegut would say you gotta do something. I, but he's, he's more hopeful than I am, which is weird to admit. Vonnegut's more hopeful than I was. He said his preferred way of suicide, his preferred method of suicide was Paul Malls. Cigarettes. That is what took him, by the way. We lived to his uh, 70s or 80s. But he always had a joke about how he was killing himself every time he smoked. He smoked every day. He was a cynical guy, is my point. All right. Any other questions? Thoughts? Stray ideas? We can wrap up real quick. Okay. For next time. Two bibs to Corston. I'm gonna talk to you about it for like two minutes. I'm gonna talk about this and I'm gonna let you go, okay? We talked about bibs last class. We looked at the prompt. If you don't remember any of that, or you weren't here, or you were only here physically, which is to say not mentally, go look at the prompt. I get so many emails. Guys, it bums me out. It bums me out sometimes the emails I get specifically about this assignment. People asking me what I want. I give you, I break it down. I think it's five things. I think it's five step-by-step step on the bib prompt. It's right there. Citation, summary, how do you think you might use the source? Give me two quotations, right? Like, do that, just do that. Do it. I believe in you. I'm not saying you can't email me, but damn it, I always get emails about this assignment. And this is the most extensive prompt I have. So I'm just saying try first, try first, and then maybe email me, okay? All that said, you gotta have a bib for Vonnegut, okay? You gotta have a bib for Jarvis. And then you gotta have two bibs for sources that you find, okay? Think about your schedule, because we have two bibs due uh, a week from today as well, okay? What I'm pointing out to you is you have a little more time on that second round of bibs. Depending on whatever your schedule looks like, you might, for instance, for next class, do a bib on Vonnegut and Jarvis. Those are texts we already have. You don't have to do any research. You can just do the bibs for those, knock them out. That gives you a week-ish from now to do the other two. That may be more involved. You'd have to research. You have to find other articles, right? You get it. But I don't know what your week is like. Maybe you're busy. Maybe you got to flip that. All I'm saying is think about the time you have versus the time you don't. Make that decision accordingly. Other than that, I'll see you next time. Thank you.